Okay, we are going to get started on intonation today. Um, so this involves uh, a couple of different things. One is just kind of understanding how intonation works in language to begin with. And uh, the second kind of related uh, topic we need to cover is how to transcribe intonation. Uh, and the two kind of go hand in hand. Um, so in order to help you with th both those things. I posted a couple of readings on Toby, which is the intonation transcription system we're going to use um, in this unit for the course, uh, to the course website. And I showed those to you in the uh, little video I made about um, the digital signal processing homework. Uh, but if we go back here to readings, um, there are both these links right here. Uh, there's also another link, which I'm going to post here in the notes in a couple of slides. Uh, which is if you're really a keener about this, this is the uh, original guidelines for Toby labeling, uh, which were created like 26 years ago now. Uh, and then I have a lot of information on how to um, become a Toby labeler. Uh, I'm going to walk you through the basics of this as we um, go through this unit in the course. Uh, and basically what I have to say about this, you can read through all this if you want, if you're confused about something. Um, but the thing with Toby is that it's a relatively simple system. There's um, not that many moving parts to it. Uh, the hard part is just learning how to listen for the right things in speech in order to be able to use it. Um, and it takes a lot of practice to do that. So normally if we have an in-class class for this um, course, uh, I walk through it uh, pretty slowly using five different um, uh, class sessions to kind of build up the, our understanding of the different elements of the system. Um, so these uh, lectures are going to be relatively short for that reason and we'll just cover a small bit of the system with each one and then also do some practice at the end of it so we can start to get the hang of it. Uh, but it takes a while to get used to because it's um, kind of um, we're focusing on a dimension of speech that uh, people don't normally think about um, because it's not normally encoded in our writing system for one. Um, and it's also something that most phonetic students uh, kind of aren't attracted to to begin with, but you might be one. And in case you are, this will be the next um, five best classes of your life, uh, maybe. So anyways, uh, you can read up on Toby if you want. I've also posted some old 341 notes on super segmental features and language to the course website. Uh, and normally the way I walk into this is by kind of going back to what we talked in, about in 341 about super segmentals in uh, language. Uh, and if you may recall, there are different um, systems that languages can use to kind of um, uh, meaningfully incorporate F0 into the language. Uh, so for instance, do you, you remember what lexical tones are. Normally I walk through these in class and then I wait until somebody pipes up and says, oh yeah, tones, they have those in say Mandarin, right? Um, and yes, they do. So we can go back uh, kind of briefly here to the super segmentals lecture uh, and say, well, look, here's an example of a tone language, Mandarin. Um, this is how F0 is used to make meaningful distinctions in the language. Each the kind of crucial part of a tone language is that each syllable or each word is going to have a characteristic um, F0 contour associated with it. Uh, and uh, most languages, which are tone languages, just have a small set, a relatively small set of tone contours which can apply to each syllable um, or word. So in Chinese, there's four basic tones. Uh, this is um, the set of tones as they're um, associated with the syllable ma. So each of these will have a different F0 contour, and each of them, for that reason, will mean something different. This is the word mother. Ma. This is the word hemp. Ma. This is the word horse. Ma. And this is the word skull. Ma. I should crank up the volume a little bit more. Ma. 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 In case you didn't hear those the first time. Um, but basically, distinctions are being um, signaled by F0 contours or changes in F0. Uh, and they apply to each syllable or word. Uh, you can contrast that with the second type, which is a pitch accent language. Um, so I guess I'll go back again and say most, the majority of languages, or at least the plurality of languages in the world are tone languages. And you, see, you find them all over the place, like uh, in China, Navajos, um, an indigenous language in the Southwestern US, uh, Igbos and from Africa, so on and so forth. There's lots of languages which are tone languages. I don't know as many languages which are pitch accent languages, but Japanese is an example, Swedish is an example. 
Um, Serbian is an example. I've learned that since I've gotten to know uh, my student Dushan. Uh, I can give you a few examples of pitch accent contrasts in Japanese, but in pitch ac accent languages, there's only one pitch accent associated, associated with each word, uh, and the pitch accent is realized on only one syllable in the word. Uh, and generally, the idea with pitch accent languages is that you're only using F0 to signal a contrast or signal some sort of meaningful distinction in the language. Uh, when we get to the third type of stress languages, uh, we'll see that stress languages can use F0, but they can also use other um, acoustic properties to signal a distinction um, super segmentally. So uh, Japanese, the pattern in this particular variety of Japanese is a little bit complicated, but I can give you uh, examples for what they sound like. So uh, you might have a high-low pattern in F0 for like a word such as morning. Uh -huh or you can go and have a low-high pattern for the same sequence of segments, but it means something different. Uh -huh. This means hemp, no connection with the other hemp in Mandarin. Um, there's a three-syllable, or in Japanese, this will be a three-mora sequence where you can get, say, high, low, low. Uh, and I'm sorry, it doesn't actually spit out the last um, syllable there properly because PowerPoint doesn't want to cooperate anymore. Uh -huh. Uh, but the idea here is that where the high is falling is kind of what makes the crucial distinction. Um, and unfortunately, can't hear this one that well, but this one ends on a high as well. So these are three different distinctive patterns in the language, and the only thing that's changing, ideally or supposedly, is the F0 pattern uh, and the other elements of su um, super segmentals that we normally think about, like intensity and duration, are staying the same um, in these examples. Uh, so lastly, we can think about um, a stress language like English, uh, where you do get more than F0 coming into play. Uh, and so we've seen examples like this multiple times with me as the speaker. <clears throat> so um, here's the word insult, or is it insult? Insult. Insult. One of them's a noun, one of them's a verb. Uh, the only way that uh, we're signaling the contrast here phonetically is by um, changing the stress. So in the first example, stress is on the first syllable. Insult. In the second, stress is on the second. Insult. How this changes pitch is that, uh, generally speaking, not always, but most of the time, um, F0 is going to be higher for a stressed syllable uh, in English than it is for an unstressed syllable. It's easiest to see in this first example. Insult. Um, it gets complicated a little bit because as we'll see, F0 tends to drift down over the course of an utterance. So when you stress the final syllable of an utterance, it doesn't make as big of a dis uh, distinction in F0 Insult. as you get for this one. Um, so I guess I'll mention as well, stress languages are complicated because they're using more than one acoustic uh, parameter to signal stress distinctions. And because they're using more than one parameter, they can kind of they have a little bit of flexibility in how they're used. Um, so uh, you can in some cases rely more on one or the other, uh, or maybe use all three together, what have you. Um, they're not as sort of set in stone as we get for say tone languages or pitch accent languages. So to give you an example um, of how the other two parameters that we normally think about in acoustic phonetics uh, change for stress versus unstressed syllables. Stressed syllables are supposed to be longer than unstressed syllables and also more intense than unstressed syllables on average. So uh, the way they kind of work together is that you perceive stress um, as correlated or how much stress something sounds is going to be correlated with the area under an intensity curve. So an intensity curve is just how um, intensity in decibels changes over time. Uh, so if there's more area underneath a syllable, it sounds more stressed, like in this word. Contrast. Um, over here, uh, again, we get um, a boost in overall intensity, and then this final syllable uh, for the verb form of this sequence is going to be longer as well. Contrast. Again, this is going to be complicated a little bit by the fact that syllables tend to get a bit longer as you reach the end of an utterance anyways. So um, you have to factor in all these things. There's also a quality difference you tend to get uh, with stress, but I'm not going to talk about those as much as long as you kind of get the idea of how these base things basically operate in three different kinds of languages. And before I go on to talk about intonation and Toby, I will also say that this is part of your course project for the course, which is to go to your um, language or 
speaker uh, and uh, or references on the language that you're studying and try to figure out what kind of a language is it. Is it a tone language? Is it a pitch accent language? Is it a stress language? Uh, and then come up with some evidence um, in your recordings of your speaker to um, kind of document uh, what decision you make on that score. Uh, so hopefully these notes will help um, in that regard. They're also going to help us try to understand um, how intonation gets implemented in English. So kind of the crucial thing is to keep in mind for English or intonation in general is that languages are going to superimpose pitch contours, basically in the form of F0 changes, on top of word-based stress or tone distinctions. Um, so normally, uh, I'm not going to talk much about intonation of tone languages, well, basically at all uh, for this because it gets complicated, but even on top of um, those tones that you might get uh, in Mandarin or Cantonese or other languages like them, you're going to get changes in F0, which signal um, sort of higher than lexical information uh, in the discourse. Uh, in English, we're going to superimpose those pitch contours on the stress patterns we get from the lexicon for each individual word. And it turns out that the way that English works is that we have word-based stress. So again, we're getting that from the lexicon, which says, you know, stress this syllable when you um, pronounce it versus this syllable or what have you. Uh, and then there's going to be phrase-based pitch accents. Um, or actually, it shouldn't, shouldn't really be phrase-based. It should be sort of conversation-based pitch accents because they come from uh, information in the discourse, which is uh, either already there or not there. Um, and then we implement them or express them um, within whole phrases, which um, incorporate one or more words in, in them. Uh, so this is intonation. I kind of garbled that uh, explanation a bit, but at the word level, we have stress and then we're adding a new level on top of that in which we're going to add pitch accents which will associate themselves with particular stress syllables and make them sound more prominent. Um, yeah, so here's where I said the pitch accents are pragmatically specified rather than lexically specified, so they change according to discourse context. Sometimes uh, in English you might accent a stress syllable in a word, and other times you might not because you don't need to according to the rules of the um, intonation game. Uh, okay, so we're going to analyze English, English intonation with a framework called Toby. Uh, the reason it's called Toby is because it actually was evolved from two separate systems which um, got together one day about 30 years ago and decided to um, make a compromise and work together uh, to further our understanding of intonation and language. Uh, on the one hand, there was a system that was used to uh, transcribe the tones, um, which is another way to think about the accents um, in a language like English. And on the other hand, uh, there was a system for um, transcribing what are called break indices in the system um, or basically the pauses and gaps that you get in between phrases and um, words or syllables in an utterance. Uh, I kind of mentioned this explicitly. Indices is the plural of the word index. Um, so there is, so you go from one index to indices. If you would prefer to say indexes, I don't have a problem with that. Uh, I'm not so much of a fan of you saying indice as an individual item because that doesn't really exist. Uh, so if it's tone and breaks, tones and break index, indexes, if you want, or tones and break indices, whatever. Uh, that's where this comes from. And then somebody was clever and said, well, this is toe and this is B. So that's where we get Toby, uh, which sounds like a cute name for the system. We'll see how cute you find it by the time we're done with it. Um, not to discourage you. Anyways, uh, we're going to analyze uh, a few samples of English utterances with this system to get the hang of it. I will mention, however, that intonational patterns can vary across dialects. Uh, so the examples we present um, today or in this unit might not match up with your own intonational system. I just suggest listening closely uh, and to see if you can find any differences between what you might do and what you hear. Um, in these lectures. Uh, let me know if you catch on to something that becomes obvious to you because it's kind of an interesting topic for further study. And I also mentioned that this framework has only been applied to a few languages, primarily Western languages, although some interesting examples abound for, um, you know, say East Asian languages as well. 
Um, but there's a lot of work yet to be done uh, in figuring out how, out how the intonation of various languages work. Uh, and this is a, another interesting topic for you to think about when you're um, working with your language consultant on your uh, language for your course project. Uh, so here's this, um, these extra links about where you can find more info about the system. Uh, I already showed you that one. There's some reading in the Course in Phonetics textbook if you still have your copy, which you can poke through, which is relatively um, a short intro to the topic. Um, we'll actually go into a little bit more detail um, in this unit um, through lecture notes and that, but that will hopefully help get you started if you um, are looking for assistance. Okay, so I mentioned this before, but in English, pitch accents align with stressed syllables. So again, we know where a word is stressed based on uh, its representation from the lexicon. And then on top of that, we might accent particular stressed syllables. So this gives us um, kind of a hierarchy of different levels of prominence when we're um, producing speech in English. And I'll walk you through this with the word exploitation, which has four syllables in it each of which has a different um, amount of prominence um, associated with it. So I've transcribed this with uh, sort of primary and secondary stress here, uh, which I don't often do when I'm using the IPA, but that kind of helps make this uh, distinction clear. <clears throat> so the first and the third syllables here are stressed. Um, every single syllable, at least in the way this is um, transcribed, is going to have a vowel of some sort in it. This vowel, uh, the schwa and shun, um, could potentially be reduced all the way to nothing and you get a syllabic N here, but we'll just roll with it as it is and say there's a schwa here. Um, but one thing that happens in stress, remember, is that you get quality differences. So uh, a stressed vowel is not going to um, be schwa in English, or at least not in the variety that um, I happen to speak. Uh, so that sort of quality distinction gives you one level of prominence. Uh, and you see that in the second syllable, which has a diphthong in it, exploitation. Uh, so again, in my variety of English, that can't reduce the schwa. In others, it, it can. You get like exploitation, something like that. Um, but in this particular example, it is not. So you get a full vowel of some sort uh, or non-reduced vowel, as it were. So that gives you one level of prominence above schwa. Uh, and then going to the next level, you get stress, like in the first and the third syllables here. And then uh, say we accent this, and let's accent this um, primary stress syllable, that gives it even uh, greater level of prominence. So exploitation. Um, and what I mean by prominence is basically how much does it stand out to you perceptually when you hear somebody um, actually say it. So exploitation. What is the syllable that's kind of the easiest to grab onto um, as you listen to it? It should be this one if it's being accented. Uh, and it should be these two basically um, because they're um, stressed and the other two are not. So these should be more prominent than the other two are as well. Um, normally the accent is gonna fall on the last stressed syllable and it has a special name for that reason. It's called the nuclear accent. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about this a whole lot in this class, but it's a term that's useful to keep in mind because you might encounter it later um, if you keep reading on. Um, intonation and pitch, ac pitch accent prominence. Okay, so we have pitch ac accents in lang uh, English. They're going to associate with stressed syllables. So the only place you're going to find them are on the stressed syllables. Uh, and to start off with, we'll talk about two different types that are either high or low. Uh, so the way we're going to transcribe them is with uh, an H asterisk, normally called an H star or an L star. Uh, so what I mean by high and low is that if it's high, you have a relatively high F0. If it's low, it's relatively low F0. These are super segmental features, just like with stress. So um, again, they're always relatively defined. When we talk about stress syllables being more or less intense or more or less um, long or greater or longer in duration, that sort of thing, they're defined relative to one another. So stress syllables are going to be longer than unstressed syllables. Uh, when you have an accented syllable, it's F0 is not going to hit a particular level. It's not going to look like we expect, a, say, um, a tone contour to look like in a contour tone language where it's going to give you a particular shape. Uh, it's just going to be relatively higher than everything else that's around it. That makes it more prominent, right? It makes it stick out a bit more because that F0 goes up and you can hear it. Uh, likewise, a low star will give you a lower F0 in general compared to things in its neighborhood. Um, so I'll give you some examples here. 
this is me. Um, and there's more going on here than just the uh, H star and the L star accents, but this gives you a sense of like the prominence uh, as we go through these very short utterances. Yes. Yes. Or. Yes. Um, and hopefully you can hear that in at least the first part of this utterance. Um, I pop up to a high F0 peak here. Yes. And you can hear me go down to kind of the low F0 trough here. I actually get into a bit of creaky voice. Yes. Yes. I didn't mean to do that twice, but it didn't hurt. Uh, it might be a bit easier to hear with a longer utterance. So this is um, going to be the stressed syllable in the word magnification. Magnification. So that's where the accent goes. And you can hear that F0 popping up there, right? Magnification. So it sounds prominent, but it sounds even more prominent than just default stress prominence, right? Uh, it's a little harder to get that prominence with low stars because it kind of, you tend to hear the high F0 is a little bit more easily, but um, this one is also going to be accented, just the F0 is going to dip down a bit. Magnification. Magnification. And there's also a little bit of creaky voice there as well. Um, like I said before, as with tones and tone languages, high and low pitch accents are defined relative to a speaker's pitch range. Actually, I didn't say this before, but um, keep this in mind as well. So you can look at, say, my pitch range, where a high star um, might be something like 155 hertz. I speak with a relatively low voice and a constrained pitch range. So something that's high is actually not really that high at all. Eight. Um, Eight. You can compare that to Mary Beckman. Um, female speaker of English and one of the inventors of the Toby system. Her H stars are considerably higher acoustically than mine, but they're the same sort of linguistic entity, right? They're just an H star defined slightly different phonetically. Eight. Same thing on the bottom of the end of the range. Eight. Yeah, it doesn't want to play that, but trust me, it's pretty low. Um, so you can see if this is my range, it's a relatively constrained one. It's only about 55 Hertz. Um, Mary's range is considerably larger. It's about 130 Hertz going from the higher to low end. And normally though, we'd expect um, speakers to have the capacity to go much higher than um, say these frequencies, it's just not used as much um, in normal speech. Okay, so uh, like I said, we looked at two kind of utterances here. Yes, there was both one word utterances. One had one syllable, one had, what is this, five syllables, magnification, yeah. Uh, the same pitch pattern can apply to an entire sentence or an entire utterance. Uh, so I'll give you some different examples. Um, Manny came with Anna. You can hear me put that H star on the first syllable of Manny. Remember the first syllable of Manny is the one that's stressed. That one, that's the one that gets the accent. Manny came with Anna. Here's uh, the same utterance with a low star on that particular syllable. Manny came with Anna. And at this point you can probably hear a little bit better that there's something else going on here at the end. I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, we can do this with um, this strange utterance. Mariana made the marmalade. Mariana made the marmalade. Uh, so this second to last syllable, Mariana, is the one that gets the stress, uh, and she's uh, attaching either a high star or a low star accent to it. Mariana made the marmalade. Mariana made the marmalade. So it kind of pops out again as more prominent. Um, Okay, so one thing you might notice now that we're going to whole utterances is that you can kind of get a sense of what the meaning differences are between these H stars and low stars. Uh, I'm kind of helping you cheat a little bit with that. I'm, there's actually different punctuation at the end, which again is associated with the sort of changing tone at the end of these utterances. Again, we'll talk about that in a second. For now, I want you to focus on the fact that there's a tendency um, to accent new information in the discourse. Uh, in, in English intonation and in fact, generally speaking, in, in intonation in human language and in general. So uh, I can give you four different patterns for four different contexts. Uh, this is with this sentence. Manny came with Anna. They're all going to be mean slightly different things and all be applicable in slightly different um, contexts as well. So what if we put the H star on Anna? Manny came with Anna. Or what if we put a low star on Manny? Manny came with Anna. Or a low star on Anna. Manny came with Anna. Uh, so we can kind of focus maybe a little bit on these. You might be like, well, who came with Anna to the party? Manny came with Anna. Gotcha. Who came with Manny to the party? Manny came with Anna. Ooh, that's interesting, right? Uh, if you are, if you actually already heard this information and just kind of want to confirm that you heard it correctly, really, Manny came with Anna to the party? Manny came with Anna. Uh, Manny came with Anna. Manny came with Anna. Oh boy. All right. So again, we're emphasizing new information in the discourse. 
because in part you can think of this as say this is the information we really want to get across to the listeners so we want to make sure it's prominent and easy to hear easy to perceive um manny came with that so you can really easily hear manny in uh, this utterance right that's the answer to the question of who came with anna to the um to the party or what have you uh, and well, these are called echo questions. They serve a slightly different function. Um, and the context in which you'd ask them is when you'd actually already heard the answer, but you wanted to confirm it again, right? Man, he came with Anna. Yeah. Um, but that's the general idea is you're helping new information get across to the listener by making it more prominent with accents. Okay. So H star is normally going to be associated with what we see as a peak in F zero. We're going to use prot to help us transcribe um, these utterances using the Toby system. Uh, it is very helpful, but it's not perfect. So you kind of have to, again, take everything with a little bit of a grain of salt. As we learn, we're walking through how digital signal processing works. Uh, it can mislead you in certain cases. So I want to make sure you understand this conceptually. Uh, when worse comes to worse, you're going to have to just tr uh, trust your ears or your brain um, and figure out what they're telling you if what you see on a computer screen seems to be misleading you. But what you should see in the ideal case is that H stars should be associated with a peak in F0 and L stars will usually be associated or ideally associated with a little valley or a trough in F0, although oftentimes you don't get anything that obvious with them. Um, and like I said, pitch tracking can help with the identification of pitch, pitch peaks and valleys and make it easier for you to do this. Uh, it's easier to analyze utterances with lots of sonorants in them, which is uh, where the people who first developed the system came up with these kind of crazy utterances like Mary Marianna made the marmalade. Marianna made the marmalade. Because these are almost entirely composed of sonorants, so it's easy to see the F0 pattern um, strung all the way through them. They don't have to be interrupted by obstruents or voiceless segments. Um, we'll look at some productions of um, sentence like, sentences like that in a second when I walk you through the example um, that I want you to think about for the lab exercise we're gonna do for this class. Uh, having established this, I will also say that there's more to the intonation contour than just pitch peaks and valleys or accents associated with stressed syllables. So, uh, what you've probably noticed already is in these statement utterances, the H star tends to be followed by a falling F0 pattern. Uh, and the L star tends to be in these questions that we've been asking, the L star tends to be followed by a rising pitch pattern. So what's going on there? Turns out there's, uh, well, in the whole system, there are three types of tones in play, but for now we'll just start with the two basic ones. So uh, there are pitch accents, which I've talked about at some length. These are the ones that are associated with a stressed syllable. Uh, and they may be either high or low uh, for now. Uh, and they are also marked with an asterisk after them. Um, so we've gotten a handle on those, but the second type, I'll walk you through how they con contrast in each of, um, each of these different properties. So boundary tones will appear not with a stress syllable. They're not, not marked on a particular word. They appear at the end of a whole phrase um, in Toby. They may also be either high or low uh, but instead of being marked with an asterisk, they're marked with a percent sign. Um, so you can just refer to them, I guess, as a high percent, or low percent, or maybe a high boundary tone or low boundary tone. Uh, kind of the crucial part here, though, in thinking about this system conceptually is that these go with a stressed syllable, uh, and these guys go just at the end of a phrase. So we have to think in bigger terms than just individual words for this system. We have to think that our utterance is actually organized into kind of smaller units, which are called phrases. And those phrases can have one or more words inside of them. Okay, so I'll show you what this looks like just at the tone level here for this um, utterance, Manny came with Anna. Manny came with Anna. Uh, and this is a rare example of a really nice uh, dip in F0 for an L star, which we see on the first um, accented syllable of Manny. Manny came with Anna. And we only lose the F0 track just a little bit there as I kind of borderline get onto creaky voice. And then after that, the F0 just rises up to the end of the utterance. Manny came with Anna. Yeah, so uh, that's kind of the pattern we generally see with um, the boundary tones is that uh, since they're not associated with a particular syllable, they're just kind of at the end of the whole phrase, um, the F0 will basically rise up or go in their general direction once they get past sort of the last accented um, 
syllable in a phrase. There's some complications to that though, so I don't want you to take that too seriously. We'll talk about it more in a couple of lectures. Uh, okay, so intonation, like I said, it's gonna organize utterances into phrases or sometimes they're called chunks again, like we called windows in digital signal processing. Uh, but basically it's gonna break up a whole utterance into one or more um, subunits, uh, which are called phrases. Uh, we're going to start out with phrases or utterances which only have one phrase in them to make it a little bit easier for us at the beginning. Uh, but when you do encounter utterances which have more than one phrase in them, you have to mark those ends in actually two different ways. So one is with a boundary tone, like H% percent sign or L% percent sign. Um, and the percent signs are associated with what are called intonational phrases, the largest phrases in the utterance. Uh, and then you're also going to mark uh, the ends of phrases with a break index or break indices. Uh, so this is the BI part of Toby. Uh, for now, we'll just look at two different types of break indices. One is going to represent a break between individual words, which normally you don't hear and it's not really even evident in the signal. It's just a way to kind of chop up where one potential stress pattern begins and ends. Uh, and number four is going to be a break between intonational phrases. Uh, so I'll show you what this looks like with the same utterance. Manny came with Anna. Uh, so at the end of the word Manny, we have a one break here. Then we have came, which is another one break. And then with, which is another one break. Uh, and then at the end, this is also the end of another word, Anna. Uh, but since it's the end of a whole phrase, the um, phrase break index takes priority and you don't mark it with a one, you just mark it with a four, which kind of subsumes the possibility of a one within it. Um, so we're marking our two different tones here. This is a simplified version for now. Um, Manny came with Anna. We've got our L star on the first syllable of Manny. We've got our H percent sign at the end of the whole utterance. And then we're marking in our individual word breaks and also our four to uh, denote that the end of the entire utterance is an intonational phrase break as well. So anytime you get one of these boundary tones, you have to mark it with a four as well. They go hand in hand. It's a bit redundant, but that's the way the system works. Manny came with Anna? Yes, he did. Okay, um, that's all I've got for now. That's the basics of the system. I'm gonna make another video uh, where I walk you through an example um, to start um, work on Toby Lab number one. I'll show you how that works. There's some technical details we need to know in order to make these transcriptions in PROT. Um, but don't worry, it's not too scary. It just takes a little bit of practice to get the hang of it. Uh, so that also will give you some um, chances to try to figure out how well you understand the system because you, you can see it applied to real life examples. So. That's next. Uh, I'll see you then.